Okay, so we've talked about some ways of proving that an argument is valid. You know, this proof method is a way of showing an argument's valid. When we get to formal logic in a few weeks, we'll talk about a few more methods of showing an argument's valid. We'll talk about truth tables. We'll talk about truth trees. There are even other methods like natural deduction. We won't talk about there's a lot going on in logic. This We only have a bit of time, right? Well, how do we show an argument is invalid, right? Well, one way we've already picked up on is if you can think of a situation, if you can imagine a case where the premises are true and the conclusion's false, you've shown the argument's invalid, right? You know, if you can describe it, you might, you know, we've drawn diagrams to do that. But if you can figure out a situation where premises are true, conclusion false, that shows the argument is not valid. Now, another way to do this is with this so-called counterexample method that um, Smith talks about. And now what's interesting about this uh, method is it works for deductive arguments. But it also, you know, we're not going to go too deeply into inductive arguments in this class. We'll mention them a few times. They'll come up. You know, we're going to mainly focus on deductive reasoning again because you know we have to cut down what we do we have to have a manageable amount of stuff but this counterexample method also works for showing that inductive arguments are well not so good right you know remember inductive arguments are never valid but this sort of counterexample method can be used to show that an inductive argument has a flaw in its reasoning that it's not a good one I'll show you guys a way that you can do that, right? Even though we're not going to go too deeply into inductive logic, you know, I, I think this is worth doing, right? Well, so what are we doing when we use the counterexample method? Well, what we're doing, you know, is we take, we have a deductive argument in front of us, and if we can find a deductive argument that has the same form with true premises that leads to a stupid conclusion, a false conclusion, we know the argument must not be valid, right? Why? Remember, deductive argument, if the premises are true, conclusion must be true as well. If we come up with an argument of the same form and the premises are true, and the conclusion's false, given what we know, we know arguments of this form can't be valid. Remember, validity is all about form. Let me give you guys a few examples. If Bob studies, he will get an A in logic. Bob got an A in logic, so he must have studied. Is this a valid argument or not, right? If you're guessing, you're probably going to say no, because we're talking about this counterexample method. If it was a good argument, you wouldn't be showing it to us. Okay, fine. Use your context clues, right? But look, this is actually not a valid argument. This is actually a fallacy we'll talk about a little bit later called um, affirming the consequent. Pops up a lot with if-then statements. You know. Later, you might, you know, just learn, okay, this is a fallacy. I recognize it, not a good argument. But look, we can use this counterexample method with this, right? If it is Christmas, the post office will be closed. That is true. The post office is always closed on Christmas, right? The post office is closed on Columbus Day. It's also true. They get Columbus Day off. I don't think I do, right? My wife gets Columbus Day off. She rubs it in. So Columbus Day is Christmas, right? That's stupid, right? We all know that Columbus Day is not Christmas. The basic problem here is there's a lot of reasons the post office might close. There's a lot of different days it's closed on. That's all the argument says. It doesn't say the only day the post office is closed is, Columbus, is Christmas, right? Similar problem here. All that this argument tells us, and remember with deductive logic especially, we have to be super literal. 
all this argument tells us is if Bob studies, he will get an A. It doesn't say that studying is the only way for Bob to get an A, right? Maybe he doesn't study, but he hires a tutor. Maybe he doesn't study, but he cheats, right? You know. Maybe, I don't know. You can think of other ways, but the argument just says this is one way for him to get an A. It doesn't say it's the only way, right? And this is one way that this counterexample method is kind of useful, right? When you see how the obviously stupid argument that has the same form goes wrong, it gives you a bit more insight, maybe, if you didn't already see it, into how the argument that's not so obviously stupid goes wrong, right? Let's take another one, right? Everyone either supports the new atheist project of relying on reason and rooting out superstition, or they do not, right? New atheists, these guys like Sam Harris, um, God, there's some English guy I'm forgetting, Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, you know, they think very highly of themselves. You're like, you support our project of, you know, reason and rooting out superstition, or you do not. And I'll admit that, right? You either support the new atheist project or you don't. Sam, that's me, doesn't. I actually think that these guys are just jerks and just make a virtue of being jerks. You know, I don't agree with their concept of reason. I think it's rather a stupid one. I don't think they're very reasonable people, actually. You know, just as a hint, you know, if somebody, like, prattles on and on about reason, it's usually a good hint that he's not a super reasonable person, right? Anyway. I would agree you either support their particular project or you don't. I don't. So they would say I'm on the side of superstition and irrationality. Is this a good argument or not? No, right? This is an argument that has the same form and you guys can hopefully see that it's not, right? Everything is either blue all over or it isn't. Kermit the Frog is not blue all over. Therefore, Kermit the Frog is red all over. Look, what this is doing is like blue and red, you know, if you look at the color wheel are opposed, you know, jumping from, well, it's not blue, so it has to be this color that's opposed on the color wheel, right? Doesn't, right? You either support these guys' projects or you don't. Well, if you don't support their particular political and social project, it doesn't mean you support the opposite one, right? You know, you either support the Democratic Party or you don't, but just because you don't support the Democratic Party doesn't mean you're a Republican, right? You might be an independent, you might vote for the Democrats about half the time, half the time for the Republicans. You might also just be somebody who does not care about politics and never votes, right? You don't support any political party. This is actually an informal fallacy called um, um, false dichotomy. We'll talk about this one a little bit more when we get to formal logic. Trust me, I know I said it's an informal fallacy. We'll talk about it more with formal logic. It will become clearer later, though. I did not make a mistake, you know, we will pop back up. Now note, you know, like I said, one of the things that's interesting about this counterexample method, one of the things I think is really useful about it, and I wish that Smith would talk a little more about this, is it works for deductive arguments, and if we use it, we can often see what is wrong with an invalid or bad deductive argument. It's also often pretty handy for inductive arguments. You know, take this one, right? I, I like to pick on J.D. Vance because, well, you know, he wrote this whole book on what's wrong with Appalachia. He's not actually from there. I'm from there, so it just seems like, well, if you're not from a place, maybe don't, you know, say what you think is wrong with it, right? He visited a few times. He has some family there. I visited California a few times. I have family there. I'm not going to pretend that I know what's wrong or right with California culture because we used to go on vacations there, right? Anyway, so that's why I'm picking on this guy, you know, gets on my nerves. 
Anyway, in his really bad book about what's wrong with Appalachia and all of us people who are from there, he says, well, I worked in a factory in high school. I knew one poor guy who was really lazy. Therefore, the vast majority of poor people are really lazy. Trust me, his actual argument is this bad. You can look in the book. Now, look, this is an inductive argument. You know, vast majority, most, whatever. But look, I think I already mentioned this, but you can see this is a bad argument by taking a similar one, right? I once visited an aquarium in San Francisco. They have an albino alligator. Like I said, we used to go on vacation to California a lot. We have family there. When I visited the aquarium, I saw an albino alligator. Therefore, the vast majority of alligators are albinos, right? Look, if you couldn't already see what's wrong with Vance's argument, you can see now, right? I have a sample size of one. Doesn't mean that most of these things are this way, right? Just because I knew saw one alligator that was an albino doesn't mean that most of them are albinos, right? Here's another inductive argument we can run this on. Most juvenile delinquents read, com read comic books, therefore comic books cause juvenile delinquency. There was another senator, um, you know, Vance is a Republican, this senator Estes Kefauver was a Democrat, you know, opposite political party. Estes Kefauver, he had some virtues, but he really got on this line about how comic books were corrupting the young, and this was his main argument. Yeah, it's not a good one, right? Well, why not? We can run an inductive argument of exactly the same form. Most men who were attacked by sharks at beaches last year were wearing swimming trunks. Therefore, swimming trunks make sharks attack people right you can see why this is a bad argument well most men at the beach in the summer are gonna wear swimming trunks it's just because they're at the beach you know everyone who's attacked by a shark at the beach is gonna be at the beach so you know correlation these things happen together one does not cause the other same problem with this argument that Kefauver was so taken with. Well, this was in the 50s and 60s. Most kids, period, read comic books. Juvenile delinquents are children, by definition. Like every other kid in the 50s and 60s, they read comic books, right? This, this is an argument that pops up over and over and over and over again, right? I think Bill Clinton was on about this about, like, maybe it was... I can't remember. Maybe it was video games, right? Most most juvenile delinquents play video games, therefore video games cause juvenile delinquency. It's an obviously stupid argument. It just never seems to die, though, right? Anyway, these are inductive arguments. I hope you guys can see, though, even though inductive isn't our main thing that we're talking about, you know, this counterexample method can be pretty useful for uncovering why really stupid inductive arguments are actually really stupid. It's just a generally useful thing to do. Now, if you're talking with somebody and you liken their argument to something really stupid, it might not win you friends, and you have to make sure you're being fair to the person, but it, it is a useful argumentative strategy. Anyway, I, I won't go too deeply into this, but let's talk about a few of the arguments that Smith gives us at the end of the chapter, and let's run this on them. So he gives us this one. Remember, you know, he really is into classical music, which nothing wrong with that, but, you know, maybe he should think maybe not all my readers are, right? Many great pianists admire Glenn Gould. He was a really great piano player. Few, if any, unmusical people at Meyer Glenn Gould, so few, if any, great pianists are musical. Is this valid or not? Well, now, remember, if we're using our context clues, if we want to go something quick and dirty, many, most, few, these are all markers that scream inductive argument. Inductive arguments are, strictly speaking, never valid. For all that, they might be good arguments. They often are. So this is not valid because it, 
you know, well, but whatever. Let's go a little deeper. Let's actually do what he wants us to do and use this method of counterexamples, right? Many baseball fans like the Yankees. Few, if any, Red Sox fans like the Yankees. That's true. They tend to hate them. So few, if any, Red Sox fans are baseball fans. Same form of argument. Look, maybe you guys don't know much about baseball. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But, you know, if you do, you know this is true. Red Sox fans don't like the Yankees. And if you know the Red Sox are a baseball team, you should know that this conclusion is false. By definition, Red Sox fans are baseball fans. But if this argument worked, we could use it to prove this stupid conclusion, right? Let me give you guys one with exactly the same form, right? Many people admire Donald Trump. Few, if any, Democrats admire Donald Trump. Therefore, few, if any, Democrats are people. You know, look, right? Obviously, this is stupid, right? And you could run it the same way, right? You know, I just picked Trump because whatever people know who he is. But you could say something like, Many people admire Franklin Roosevelt. Few, if any, Republicans admire Franklin Roosevelt. Therefore, few, if any, Republicans are people, right? Plug in whatever you want. This is obviously stupid. So this form of argument does not work, right? Let's try one more here. All logicians are rational. No existentialists are logicians. I actually think Smith tends to not like the existentialists. He thinks they're irrational. But whatever, right? I actually kind of have a soft spot for them. Maybe not Sartre, but some of the others. Anyway, all logicians are ir irrational. No existentialists are logicians. So if Sartre is an existentialist, he isn't rational. Find, plug, replace. You could come up with something like this, right? Is this valid? There's a lot of ways we can figure it out. But one way to show that it's not is just to run an argument like this, which obviously has a stupid conclusion. All cats are animals. No dogs are cats. It's both true, right? So if Rex is a dog, he isn't an animal. That's stupid. Obviously, if Rex is a dog, he is an animal. We have two true premises here that if the argument was valid would prove a stupid conclusion. We know the argument isn't valid. Anyway, he doesn't talk a lot more about this counterexample method. We're not going to use it a lot more. But I think, you know, in day-to-day -day life, it is actually pretty useful. It's a, a good way of testing an argument, so it's worth covering. It might not, you know, it's good for seeing if an argument is valid, if it's a deductive argument. It's also not a bad way for seeing if inductive arguments are good inductive arguments. Now, I will tell you, it might not win you friends at parties, right? You know, you say, well, but your argument is equivalent to saying, you know, no dogs are animals, you know, whatever. Might be a reason that logicians are not the most loved people in the world, right? But, you know, sometimes it is good to evaluate arguments, and when you want to, sometimes it can be a little jerky, but in the situations where it's good to, this is a pretty useful strategy.